This is Something to Talk About. Something to Talk About is a program at the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center. We do several times a week, and once a month, we get to check in with Ann Lovejoy and get advice or start arguments about gardening and uh, what to do with the with the food we're harvesting and how to uh, how to roll with the seasons. And so we're going to do that again today. I want to start, though, by um, thanking Fieldstone Communities of Bainbridge Island, which is um, a sponsor of uh, these programs on the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center, and they have uh, they have memory care and assisted living and independent living up on Rolling Bay, and uh, you can uh, schedule a tour uh, by going to look for FieldstoneCommunities.com uh, online, or um, you can uh, call them, and the phone number if these. Uh, Little pop-ups will stop popping up. The phone number is 206-594-1010. Also, we always want to make a point of reminding ourselves and you that we are meeting on the ancestral homelands of the Puget Sound Coast Salish people, specifically our neighbors, the Suquamish tribe. And we are grateful for their wisdom and hospitality and their willingness to help us learn about the Salish Sea and the lands that surround it, which, which they have uh, been taking care of and uh, mindfully living on since time immemorial. Anne, welcome. Right. Thank you, Reed. Yeah. And what a gorgeous day. Oh, and, man. Right. It's so interesting because everybody keeps saying this is going to be the last good day. And then we get another one. And, you know, El Nino is tricky. We have no idea what we're actually going to get. Um, nobody does. So it's all a big treat and a wonderful surprise to get a day like this in the middle of uh, the rainy season, right? I'm grateful for the rainy season as far as that goes, because we've been so dry, deep in drought for a long time now. And this is a real blessing. It's um, perfect when it does this little dance where we get to see how beautiful it is and and, and revel the wind with the blustery wind this morning. It was just so delightful to walk. Exactly. It felt so fresh. <laughs> so, Holly, I'm wondering if you have questions before I start jumping in. Um. Well, and I'm, I'm a bit confused as to how to when what time of year to cut stuff back. What kind of stuff? Uh, everything. Um, uh, hydrangeas, rhododendrons. I have a, a monster um, honeysuckle that um, it, it had a, it was a strange thing. Uh, it's grown up through the deck. It's more than 20 years old. It's a big monster. It's like 20, 30 feet long. Uh, and it had some dead pieces on it. Uh, like three quarters of it was dead. And we didn't know why that that hadn't happened before this year. So my mother-in-law was staying, so she cut it back very aggressively to about the last 10 feet. And when she did that, I thought it was a bit over the top, but anyway, when she did that, um, it hasn't grown back since, but what we found was that it was growing through a hole in the deck and it was restricted by the hole in the deck. So it did actually have a serious problem, but I'm wondering if that's ever going to come back. That's my big personal question, but mainly it's when to cut stuff back in the winter or in the, in the spring. Well, let's start with the honeysuckle. When did when did the great cut occur? About a month ago. OK, mm, I'm a little surprised you haven't seen some new growth, but did she cut just to bear stuff? just bare trunk kind of yeah was, ah okay it will probably sprout again but since it's growing up through the deck which isn't optimal and it's already been strangled if it doesn't that's really not a terrible thing and i would suggest that somebody other than yourself probably climb under the deck dig it out and put another one somewhere that isn't on the house a big honeysuckle like that can get 60 feet easily and be very very heavy and having that kind of plant life sharing your deck is probably not optimal because that's when you start getting things like carpenter ants and stuff in there too. Um, and as you know, it's you know constricted and not going to be doing so well. But also, a lot of plants have a a lifespan, and right. you know they get to a point where they're really not as vigorous as they were, and that might be the end of that. But getting the root ball out of there is probably a really good idea. And if you love the honeysuckle, maybe put some really sturdy posts and make an arch or an arbor away from the house and, and put a new one on that. Mm -hmm. That's I what like I would that. suggest. 
But as far as cutting things back, there's a couple of things at play. Some stuff like the rhododendrons, you don't really need to cut them back. If they are too big for where they are, it's probably better to try to move them, which they move extremely easily and have a, a really quite shallow saucer shaped root. So you go out to about the drip line and do a, a sort of a, a shallow cut. And then with the help of strapping younger people, drag it onto a tarp and then drag the tarp to where you want it. Um, often if they've been too close to a structure or building, they'll have a flat side. And so I always say, you know, if you're in a woodland area or something like that, they like that with the edge of the woods. So put the flat side toward the woods and have the pretty side toward you and plant it out a bit because all those woodland plants are going to keep getting bigger too. That isn't, you know, as you notice, we get creep from all, everything, you know, all the native plants are keep on keeping on, right? Um, if you have a fence or something like that, you can plant it again, flat side toward the fence, but don't put it against the fence, give it some room. So there's good air circulation. And in the future, you can always cut stuff off the back and not let it touch the, bit, the fence. Um, to That actually, again, it's like keeping carpenter ants and borers and beetles and things like that and off the structure, but also making sure there's good air circulation within the body of the plant. If, that if I'm going to move a rhododendron, what kind of uh, environment should I look for? How much sun? How much water? Yeah, so the bigger the leaf, the less sun they like. So the big leaf uh, roadies really prefer morning light or filtered light and do not particularly appreciate afternoon light. And that's when you start to see scorching and leaf curl. Um, the smaller the leaf, the more sun they can handle. So those little bitty leafed ones can even take pretty much what passes for full sun here in the Northwest, which often isn't particularly uh, sunny, right? Um, so that's a good rule of thumb. They um, they like open, beautiful soil, unlike what we usually have. So giving them a nice mulch is really helpful. They like compost rather than fertilizer. And they really, um, they don't mind companion plants as long as they're not deep, deep rooters. So things like uh, the epimedium can go underneath the rhododendrons perfectly happily, or you can let the rhodes go all the way to the ground and then you don't need a, a understory plant. Uh, right. Um, they will sprout back from old growth pretty well. Like even if you cut them very hard, you'll start to see new shoots coming off the old trunks. But I got to say, they're not going to be very attractive for a couple of years because they take a little time to get some semblance of shape back. The thing about the big old rhododendrons we often see on older houses is many of them are essentially arboreal. They want to be a tree. They could be 30 feet tall. And that may not be exactly right for where they are right now, which is why moving them is a really good idea. Because keeping them under control for the rest of your life or their life, um, that's kind of a losing game. And it's better to put something where it, it can be what it wants to be and then put have a different plant that's the right size and shape at maturity where the other one was. Does that make sense? So I've yeah. seen them growing uh, next to, as you say, our native or quasi-native forests. They like that, probably that kind of turf. Well, right, because, you know, we have native rhododendrons too, right? And they will be very happy in that same. I don't know. Do you remember when 305 went in towards Silverdale and they clear cut a lot of the side and the rhododendrons, the native rhododendrons came back, but they all turned yellow and got really scorchy because they're understory plants and they're big leaved. And um, and then I noticed collectors were coming and digging them up for a while there, but but they're very resilient as far as coming back from being cut hard, but they really do better with filtered shade or less direct light. What about things like uh, ferns? Is this what time of year, if you were going to try to trim your sort of messy ferns, if you wanted to do that, maybe you shouldn't do that, but. You mean sword ferns? Yeah. Yeah. So sword ferns are evergreen and those fronds, each frond lasts usually two, three to five years. And what you'll see is the greenest ones are at the core. And then as they age out, they start to flop. And if you just cut the outer ones that are starting to go down and show brown, it will, will prolong their life considerably. In the wild, they can live for hundreds of years. In somebody's backyard where they get clear cut every year, they can die in 10. 
um, because that is taking all that reserve away and making them work super hard to replace what would have lasted three to five years, right? Does that make sense? So if you uh -huh. just take the brown ones off and then instead of taking them away and composting them and bringing the compost back, you do the chop and drop, which is simply chop, 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 drop, drop, drop. Let all the nutrients that are stored in those browning off leaves are specifically designed to feed that fern. So just let it become part of the uh, self-composting uh, litter, if you would, underneath yeah, the urn. That, that's a nice way to make a compromise. Our desire for not having that all that brown stuff, but not denying the plant the food. Right. And if you really can't stand the look, you can put some compost over to the top or some a, a mixture of compost and medium wood chips, which will keep the, um, it, the compost from getting washed away or blown away. Right. And this is where you say wood chips, not bark. Not exactly. Wood chips, not bark. Exactly right. Because bark is not just useless, it's actually harmful in many situations. But cutting back other stuff, um, like perennials and things, you can start doing that now. But if there's areas of the garden that are not overlooked directly and, and aren't going to get up your nose if they're not trimmed back, Consider leaving a lot of that because one of the things we know now is that native bees and other pollinators and butterflies often will leave eggs or go do make little dormitories, right, in a hollow stem or under the head of a seed head. And also, of course, lots of birds will come and take all the seeds out of those seed heads. So leaving those standing anywhere that you can bear it, <laughs> um, it's just really a generous way to kind of share the share the ground with all the critters, right? I personally love seeing the garden full of birds. So I leave all kinds of things up till the birds have stripped them clean. And then even then I might cut it and drop it. And that way, if there is somebody living in the stem or under the seed head, they can continue their cycle and come out in the spring. And by then everything will have sort of moldered down anyhow. Um, but they like grasses and things like that too. The ornamental grasses are not good to divide in the fall because they tend to rot out. You can trim them if you want to, but do it like take a big hank of them, twist it, use a grass hook and cut them about knee high. And rather than a kind of military buzz cut, because that's when the rain gets in and sogs them out and they rot out rather than re-sprout happily. What else are you thinking about cutting back if there's anything specific? Oh, hydrangeas you said, right? Yes. Yes. So again, Here's the thing, hydrangeas are really pretty tough and most of them are really quite hardy. So you're not so worried with some plants, especially like some of the hybrid roses and things, you don't really wanna to cut too much off the top at this time of year or even really until like mid-February because if it gets really cold, you'll get winter kill that will take out that top growth, right? And if you've left some, that can be the sacrificial victim and then what's left underneath is gonna re-sprout better, right? But with hydrangeas, they're really pretty tough. Um, some people like to wait a little bit longer. And the, as the color starts to fade and the flower, florets become kind of papery, that's when they will last the longest as a dried, um, dried arrangements or wreaths or whatever it is. I notice them in a lot of holiday wreaths now. So I think people are kind of hanging on to stuff like that. Um, and if you have a lot of them, maybe you can bring them to the art museum on the morning of October 28th, Saturday, and help us incorporate them into the beautiful welcoming arms of the ofrenda, the, um, which is a kind of the beautiful shrine for the memory of people who have been lost, but also a farewell to summer. And we make these amazing, gorgeous, um, outstretched arms of old and, and dying foliage and flowers, which sounds gross, but it's actually really pretty. <laughs> Go ahead, I'll check it out. That's interesting. Yeah, it's really fun. We start at nine. And if you want to show up and help, you'd be super welcome. Here's the thing about hydrangeas. When you cut them, if you look at the stems, you'll see there's old brownish stems or grayish stems. You can take out anything that's dead. The grayish ones usually are just gone. Um, the brownish ones often have the softer green, bright colored tips coming up. And you can take those down and look for a pair of leaves and cut, make a slanting cut so that the rain rolls off, doesn't sit and pool and, and have a little dieback. Um, but that, you can do that anytime you want. I uh, usually actually wait and do it a little later in um, 
in the winter, partly because I see a lot of birds in those in those uh, hydrangea bushes, and I don't I want them to have that shelter as long as they need it. And you know, to me, the older it's just take off the the dead flowers when you when they start looking ugly, but you don't need to cut back hard. And again, if you do need to cut back hard, it might be because the shrub is in the wrong place and it's getting too big for its britches. They're so easy to transplant. Like a rhododendron, they transplant it very quickly and easily, especially if done by other than you. Um, that's what strapping young people are for and get them to just put, move it out to a position where it can be how big it wants to be and not be trying to, uh, you know, control really, right? Excellent. Does that answer most of the, your questions? Yes, I, I planted a bunch of hydrangeas and, I, and I'm trying to go ferny because they're, they're more local, aren't they? More more healthy for the birds and the other, other creatures. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, one of the things, we, you know, we can do if we want to is really make sure that part of our property, at least, is kind of a, a wildlife sanctuary, which means we put in a lot of native stuff and plants that are good, um, that provide shelter, right? And we do things like leave the seed pods so that somebody can come and eat the seeds, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just, it's a much more relaxed way to garden. And one of the things I find that's really helpful is just take your glasses off. And then everything's kind of soft and misty and it doesn't get up your nose. You know, you don't get annoyed by the untidiness. But I think, you know, nature is not intrinsically tidy and yet it always looks great, right? When you go in the woods, you don't go, oh, messy, messy, messy. But that's the result of allowing an ecosystem to develop. And even in our small yards, you can have a small ecosystem and support a surprising amount of, of life, native mm -hmm. plants and native critters too. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to- Oh, go ahead. I'm trying to kill as much of my grass as I can get away with. <laughs> I'm doing the cardboard compost kind of situation through the winter and then trying to plant plants in there because grass is evil. <laughs> well, it's just so wasteful. I mean, it, it doesn't really support anything. And, you know, it's one of those carryovers from the kind of English uh, tradition that it was all about, you know, the more lawn you had, the more money you had, right? Was, and that became adopted very quickly in America. And people were like, yeah, lawn. And then of course, after World War II, there were all those munitions companies that were converting to making fertilizers because the same chemicals go in both. And so they were promoting, you know, weed and feed products that are horrible for the soil. And these big expanses of pristine lawn, which again, are de just dead zones as far as many creatures are concerned. So you're totally on the right track. And one of the things you do, I do is like, when you block off a big area like that, again, those wood chips are invaluable. Cover the whole thing with the layer. You can do cardboard and then a layer of compost on top of that. But also you can throw all kinds of leaves and things on there and then top the whole thing off with the medium wood chips, not bark, and um, let that just kind of molder down. And then in within a year or two, depending on the weather, if it's a rainy winter, it'll break down a lot quicker. If it's a drier winter, it'll take a couple seasons. But underneath it, the worms are going to be working. All the biota in that top few inches of soil gets a chance to really get going. And you're creating beautiful soil habitat, right? And then you can just plant a strip at a time. And one thing that does is it doesn't get out of control. It isn't like opening Kansas, which is kind of depressing when you suddenly get weeds all over the place. But just open as much as you feel like you can manage and then start putting in things that you like. Um, and adding maybe native perennials and bulbs as well as whatever exotica you're interested in. But take it a little at a time. And if it's a sunny place, I always put in a lot of herbs uh, because they're long blooming, especially the oreganos. There's so many beautiful mm. kinds and they bloom a really long time. All the, you look, gosh, sometimes you can see 10 or 20 kinds of different pollinators on there within the course of an hour. And they hold their little seeds a long time and a lot of the little birds love those. So it kind of provides, you know, food and shelter and entertainment for a long, long time. Yeah, come nice. by the senior community center. Anne has planted a bunch of oregano in the little island that's right in front of the, and you can take a look at how it, how it looks. I was going to say that, um, you know, I used to 
try to keep up with removing all of the seed pods from some of my plants. And it helps me let them be when I know now that the birds are really appreciating them. So it does mean I don't have to climb up on the ladder and, you know, and uh, I'm actually being a more friendly neighbor to all the critters. Exactly. And One other thing you'll notice at the senior center, which I think is really fun, is that if you look to the west, as you walk down the sidewalk going toward Cups or the Eagle Harbor Church, you'll notice little pockets of oregano all the way along this, between the sidewalk and the street. There's those, you know, that crack where the plants always go. There's a whole lot of oregano's growing in there for about a good hundred yards or more. How funny. I know. I think it's great. And calendulas, that's another one that's kind of making its way around. Birds love like those. Mm. You mentioned uh, you mentioned bulbs about some of the things we might plant in there. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a little bit about bulbs because uh, it's time of year when we think about that. Right. And one of the things that um, that people always ask is like, how deep do I have to plant the bulbs? And I think what's kind of wonderful to know is that there was a um, well a couple of years ago now, but there was a study. You just take your, there you go. Yeah. When I tried to move something, it did that. A study from Cornell that showed that you, you don't really have to plant bulbs as deeply as people used to think. And that the growers who lift them every year were saying, you know, this is really a lot of work. And so they were doing a study on all kinds of bulbs, commercial bulbs, like tulips and stuff, to see if, um, what was the best, they call it perennialization potential, right? Like if you want to perennialize those tulips or you want to plant them with less effort, it turns out shallower planting is actually better. So even though most bags of bulbs will tell you to plant the tulips at least like eight inches deep or that kind of thing, or plant the bulb to three times the depth of its, like if it's a three inch bulb, then it should be, you know, nine inches deep. They're saying, actually, turns out that it doesn't really work like that, especially in heavy clay, which is what we mostly have. So one of the ways to do that, if you want to plant a bunch of them, is you kind of strew them around or get your grandkids to do it or rent a kid because they do random much better than we do and throw them around and then actually just cover them with a few inches of compost. Cover them. but um, And then again, good old wood chips on top of that, if it's a large area that helps them. But uh, they they did loosen the beds before they did that in the planting areas. But most of the time, if you're in a bed, you know, you're planting in your own yard in a bed, not in the meadow or something, the ground is already pretty soft. So you can just kind of place them on loosened soil, cover them with four to six inches of mulch and call it good, which is great. And the little bulbs, things like um, crocus, you know, and snowdrops and that, they naturalize so quickly. And one of the cool things you can do with those is in a lawn or meadow, you cut a flap with that. And I love my shovel. I have this incredible shovel called the Root Slayer that's heavy and it has these fangs. And you just go kunk and then flip up a piece and don't take, don't take it out. You just keep a hinge on it and then stick the little bulbs in there and flap the, the turf back on, step on it, boom, there you go. And that's how you can naturalize bulbs all over the place in a lawn or meadow, which looks pretty cool. Then you have to hold off and, and do the no mow may thing um, and let them ripen their foliage, but at, they'll multiply like crazy if you do that. So uh, encouraging your lawn, then no mow may becomes a lot easier of a thing to do, I guess. Exactly. So, um, Let's see if I can find this, the, the controls on this. Uh, they've added a whole bunch of AI. Oh, isn't that handy? To, yeah, to, uh, to our choices. Here's share screen. I just was going to show you what um, the root slider looks like. Oh, yeah. They're awesome. I don't think I paid that much for mine, but um, maybe I did. Well, anyway, they're fantastic. I, they're I didn't heavy. look. I didn't look for the best price, but I just looked for a picture. 
they're very heavy, which is nice. So it does a lot of the work for you just by being heavy, right? And you don't have to put too much in it. And it's got a nice step rim. So you can put your foot on there and add my not inconsiderable weight to the whole thing that really takes it down. But it goes through gravel, which not many shovels. Wow. Work. I know. It's really great. It's, it's worth it for the name alone, Root Slayer. No, right? It gives you that feeling of agency and empowerment, which is so good. <laughs> The one thing to think about with bulbs, though, is that they really, um, they tolerate water. Like right now, the spring bulbs that are already in the ground, they're waking up. They're starting to put a lot of root growth out. And then sometimes the ones in the bag that we haven't planted yet have also done the same thing and are starting to put roots out. So moisture right now is fine for them. So if you're digging and the soil is kind of wettish, that's okay. But, um, and as of course, as they come into bloom, spring or summer, moisture is fine. But once their bloom is over, then moisture becomes a liability because most, almost all the bulbs that we love and admire come from parts of the earth where dry, hot summers are the common thing. Um, and so if they're watered, if they're in an irrigated area through the summer, that's often when bulbs get, will dwindle or die out because they actually can drown once they're in dormant state, if that makes sense. Um, so making sure when you plant them that they're in an area that's not going to get supplemental summer water is is really important to the longevity of of bulbs. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. that's very good to know. I know. It's another thing you don't have to do too, right? I love that. Right. And if you if you know what you're doing, then you don't have to do it. <laughs> so exactly. um uh let's see, let's talk about cuttings right now. Is it a good time for that? It is a great time for that. October, November are kind of golden times to do root, to cut, make cuttings of um, softwood and hardwood, really. And one of the things you want to do when you do that is look for stems, like if you wanted to do a hydrangea, say, they root extremely easily. Um, you can literally put them in a bucket and most of them will root. But if you also just want to have a few little plants in a pot, you cut at an angle just above where the um, the leaf buds are. And then you stick it into the into the soil to the next set of leaf buds. So they're just above the soil, but you've got a good chunk of stem underneath, right? And then that's what you do, basically. I keep them you know, in an area where they're gonna get natural water. And usually you'll get 70 to 80% strike, a good success with that many things you can do that way. You can do it with rosemary, you know, taking the tip, cutting it to strip this, um, anything that's going to go under the ground should be stripped clean so that you, you don't have rotting foliage. And then that way the new roots will form really quite readily at this time of year. When you're taking like a rose, for instance, you want to take a stem that's not lishy soft, but it's also not rigid like a pencil, right? It's a, a firm, but not not snappable and not too soft to right like that and then you take it back to the mother branch and you cut it with just a little sliver of the mother branch on it so, so that it's got just a bit of that on at the end and then sink that as well and again cut the lower leaves off and if there's a strong growing tip that's great if there isn't you can just cut a little bit off um some people like to cut all the leaves in half. I've never found that that really made that much difference. They want the plant to think about roots and not worry too much about keeping on sending nutrients to those big leaves. But I don't think it makes a huge amount of difference myself. But yeah, this is a great time for many, many things. If you have sedums and succulents, basically, if you just take some of those stems, cut them off and lay them down sideways, they'll root at every node. And you'll have lots of those to share if you want to. Nice. Yeah. And, you know, those leather leaf burgenias, for instance, there's that beautiful one called Alpenglut, which, and they turn rosy red in the wintertime and they're really pretty. You can just snap those off. They, they dig them up and they've got roots like ginger kind of, and you snap off a piece that has a surface root and then longer roots underneath and just plant that with, just like you would iris um, with a little bit of bare uh, bare root showing, not the stringy ones, but the solid kind. And then, boom, you can make 20 plants out of one big one, which is kind of fun. Nice. 
Let me look at some of the. Oh, we had some questions, I guess, about fruit trees and uh, scabby fruit. Yeah, so scabby fruit. Um, let me pull up her question here. Yes, so this gal had a, a weeping sore on her fruit tree, for starters, and that was uh, part of her question. What is going on with that? And actually several people have talked about that lately um fruit trees especially here in the northwest in the coastal northwest often can get something called phytophthora gamosis and gamosis is uh it often creates a kind of a red looking oozing sap dripping wound that looks gross and a lot of the fruit trees are really easily wounded and they're kind of thin skinned. And once they get one of those like weed whacker damage or something like that, or a branch breaks and cracks and rips the bark as it goes down, and then you've got an open sore essentially, um, a lot of different things can cause that. Chemicals, too much fertilizer, insects, disease, you know, wounds, blah, 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 mechanical damage as we call it. And really the, um, the best thing you can do is clean it up as carefully and let it dry off. and trying to uh, keep the, that piece, the damaged area clean, you can cut the damaged bark away, the dark, icky, diseased stuff, and then get back to where you find healthy, light brown, kind of greenish bark on the edges. Um, so you're not, you're just peeling some of that icky stuff off and then you get back to where you're seeing that lighter brown or green bark. It's like the first layer under the skin, does that make sense? and then clean the margins as best you can and let it dry out. And sometimes people will actually put like a little umbrella kind of over it to try to keep that area drier. Let it dry out and then just keep it as clean as you can. And you don't need to put anything on it. It's like nothing is actually gonna help um, heal it. But if on occasion I have put a little compost kind of around those edges, so because it's populating it with, um, with the healthier bacteria and other critters that are, are good for helping things heal. Um, the other issue I've had several people asked about scabby fruit, and that is another problem here in the Northwest that um, that can be a little challenging because <laughs> uh, nobody really likes to hear this, but it's like the, um, the fruit that lets, that falls under the trees and is left to rot is usually the, the source of the, the problems, right? Or the leaves that are infected and they fall in the trees and nobody's cleaning up under the trees. Well, it's a lot to do, right? Um, but one of the things that can happen is then you start getting these scabs, which they really look like scabs over old wounds. It's kind of gross. Um, and it's unsightly. And the interesting thing is scabby fruit that's not badly affected, you can still use it for making juice or cider or something like that. And once you peel it, it's fine to eat it raw or cooked. But once it gets advanced, they, they ruin the fruit because they crack the skin and it's make a split. And of course, that's just like ready to eat smorgasbord for scavengers from birds to beetles and bugs. And some, some birds actually love fermented fruit when it starts to... Uh, offer a little Oktoberfest for birds. And you'll see, <laughs> I remember watching thrushes eat um, fermented apples and then start staggering around like, you know, drunks on a Saturday night. But the open skin wounds also provide like perfect opportunity for diseases of which there are quite a few. Um, yeah, you can see, doesn't that look gross? It's icky. But the thing is, um, those scabs, like apple scab and pear scab, they're caused by different fungal species, but they're related and they look really similar. And I always say it's kind of like athlete's foot for fr fruit because it's like, yeah. right? They go dormant <laughs> in the hot, dry weather, but they wake up and they start to spread as soon as autumn gets moist in the cool, foggy mornings. They love that. Um, and first with the affected fruit, you'll just see these little pimply dots and then they kind of, and you'll like pin pricks almost. And they kind of run together and make these little flat discolored blotches. And then they form darker masses and then they crack like that picture that Reed showed us. Um, 
and we had a fairly warm, dry summer. So we don't necessarily see the scab until right about now when the, you know, apples are still on the tree and they're starting to, um, you know, get, have be attractive to many creatures, not just us. And among them are these fungal growths, right? So the biggest way to deal with all this is hygiene, which, you know, it can cover like those blotches, not just cover the fruit, they also start appearing on the leaves and they'll even be on the new leaves because spring, the fungus is still active, right? So if you see the dark green or brown blotches on the leaves, you wanna really start doing a very careful cleanup, which means taking, raking away all the leaves, which are loaded with fungal spores and putting them, you can put them in the green waste because a good hot compost will take care of them, but many home composts don't get hot enough to really kill it off. So what you're doing then is growing some more in your own compost heap. Uh, but once you clear it away, then you put horticultural lime down, which is not dolomite lime, it's the um, horticultural lime that will help change the acidity of your soil. And then you wanna put a few inches of the mature compost, little bit at the trunk, but much more around the drip line because around the drip line is where all the active feeder roots are. And that's where the action is for, and that's where a lot of the leaves are gonna fall off too, right? So you get the leaves out of there, clean it up, put down some lime and then some compost. And then that will actually, a couple of years of that, you probably have to do it for a couple of years, should really make a big difference. Um, you can also, you know, goose up your home composting if that's what you really want to do by putting in like a nitrogen source like cottonseed meal or corn gluten along with the fungi, funky leaves. And that will often um, hot it up just enough. But um, so once you get a disease free tree, that's awesome. Um, then you should be able to get away with a, you know, you still want to do the autumn cleanup. And this is one case where you're not leaving the leaves to rot down. If they're diseased, get them out of there. If they look fine, they are probably fine. And then just cover them with compost so that you get a nice rot happening without disease. Um, but if they keep getting reinfected, you might wanna think about putting in less uh, susceptible or more disease resistant varieties. And um, if you look on the extension service, websites, especially the Mount Vernon one, they have a research station up there and they've been doing multi-decade trials of all kinds of apples and pears to look specifically for reliable varieties that are resistant to scab and other diseases, even in El Nino years or La Nina years and so forth. And there's a lot of really good ones. Um, you can look them up on the website, but- I'm So thinking, Mount Vernon Extension Service. Yeah, yeah. And the ones okay. they recommend are things like uh, Crimson Crisp and um, Bell Mac and Gold Rush and John of Free, <laughs> which is like a Jonathan type that's free of disease and red free um, Sundance. There's some good ones. And the pears, they have like um, Barnett Perry and Brandy and Arabasma, you know, Muscat and Orca. Orca is a good one. So there's a good there's a good variety. And the most of the local nurseries have that. You you, you meant you meant oh you mentioned something about uh, adding corn gluten to pop up your compost. Let's mm -hmm. we let's can we talk a little bit about compost and what to do because it's going to get really wet out there, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and first of all, talk about corn gluten because corn gluten is a pretty cool stuff. It is a uh, it's basically a throwaway ingredient left over from making cornmeal, right? But it, uh, some years ago, some researchers were looking for inexpensive ways to create nitrogen, high nitrogen sources, for plant food for plants that didn't involve chemicals, right? And turns out like corn gluten is like 911, right? So it's high in nitrogen. And one of the things it also does, and nobody is exactly clear why, is that it suppresses seed sprouting. So when seeds start to open, it dries them out which is great if the seeds it's it's desiccating are weeds. Not so good if you've just put it around your new little garden in the spring and have planted a bunch of stuff. So depending on what you're using it for, if you're using it for weed suppression, you wanna put it out like early, early or late, late because here in the Northwest, we get a ton of weed seeds germinating in the winter when it's wet, right? And so that's a good time to put down corn gluten and, um, on the package, it will tell you the distribution rate, but I usually just throw it around like chicken feed, you know, 
spread it around, and that actually does a couple things. It prevents the seed germination, and it provides a lot of nitrogen to the soil, which will wait until things start growing, right? And it doesn't like it doesn't harm perennials or bulbs or things like that. It's strictly about drying out seeds as they begin to the seed sheath opens, it dries it out, boom, they're done. Um, so another way to use it, and it lasts about six weeks, right? So if you've used it in the winter and then you want to start a crop, wait a little while, get your seedlings growing, plant those. And then you can even direct sow after that. And then when those seedlings have sprouted, that's when you can put on another layer of corn gluten as a natural fertilizer, right? But in the compost, what it does is it's a, you know, compost you wanna have kind of equal, roughly equal amounts of carbonaceous stuff and nitrogen, nitrogen boosting stuff, right? So we say green brown, right? So if you put in a whole bunch of grass clippings, you wanna have also, ground off leaves or some straw or, you know, corn stalks or things like that that are on the other side, right? Coffee grounds, very high nitrogen. They're awesome. They really make a hot compost heap. Um, and so does corn gluten. So you can throw some corn gluten. If your compost is kind of puttering along and it's not doing much, try putting in a bunch of compost, I mean, uh, of coffee grounds and then also some uh, corn gluten mix that in a little bit and you'll often see them really take off. And as it cools down, you'll also usually find a ton of red wiggler worms in there because they love that second stage of the compost as it starts to go down and they really like coffee grounds. It's kind of cool. Excellent. Can you tell me about the other item that you had on your checklist, which was uh, restorative soil care, which seems like a natural follow from compost? Oh, yeah. But before I forget, I also have to say one, one person said, is it time to start my tomatoes from seed? <clears throat> it cracked me up. I thought that was adorable. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to say to everybody, no. It's really too early to start your tomatoes from seed. Unless you're <laughs> unless you're moving to the another um, another hemisphere. <laughs> but I thought that was really great. He's like, I know you have to get an early start, but you know what? Some people do start in January. Some people even start in December. But starting tomatoes from seed around here, it's kind of a responsibility, and it's like you have childcare for six months practically. So you want to actually think about that before you start a whole ton of them, um, and you don't do it yet. No, but soil restoration, yeah, this is a great time because if you've been growing wonderful things all summer and you start harvesting and then you think about planting cool season crops, before you do that, you really want to do some soil reparation and restoration. And again, some of your best friends are going to be things like the corn gluten to mix that in or top dress with it so that it can do the two things you want from it. Um, if you're planting young plants like kale, winter lettuce, leeks again or you know things like that which you can still do that at this time um then corn gluten is a wonderful top dressing because again it supplies a lot of immediately available nitrogen and it will keep weed seeds from germinating which they are lovingly trying to do right now um, <clears throat> but uh the other piece of course is covering it like bare earth is definitely an invitation to nature to do whatever she has in mind, which is not always what you have in mind. Um, and there are always things that are just, you know, the turn of a spade turns up seeds every time too. All the weeds of disturbance, most of them interestingly are not native. Um, uh, they're called weeds of disturbance because they're the things that pop up when you turn the soil or disturb the soil. And interestingly, most of them are actually uh, invasives that have come with, you know, settlers across the country come from Europe, many of them. Um, <laughs> but, you know, native plants will also sow themselves around, which is great. Um, and you can actually take seeds of things like the native coral bells. They have their long stalks and the little dried up flowers. If you take those and shake them like a little salt shaker over a patch of earth, um, next spring you'll probably find lots of little baby uh, coral bells coming up there, right? So that's a good time to put, to sow seeds of 
native perennials and also of what we call hardy annuals. When you look at a seed packet, it will usually say HA up in the corner somewhere, which means hardy annual, which means you can sow them now, they'll do their germination thing over the winter and by spring they'll be way ahead of what whatever you were going to sow in the spring and they'll be blooming a good month earlier usually than uh spring sown stuff so that oh, that's that's helpful to know yeah. yeah and you mentioned some of the um uh you mentioned the coral bells i'm wondering about also like lupin or stuff like that where they're we're seeing things that are going to seed now yeah and the thing about lupins i mean there are native lupins they're not native actually to this immediate environment, but they're native to the Northwest. But lupins are not a plant for a small garden because they don't really do much. They bloom for about two weeks and then they stand there looking kind of ratty for quite a long time. So unless you're really committed to that, I would say that wouldn't be something. But if you love them, you can scatter those seeds around. Yeah, and a lot of, of plants, the seeds are drying now, the seed pods. Um, if you shake a pod, and you do not hear a rattling, they're not really ripe. That's one thing. And and if you cut the seed pods off before they're ripe, they usually don't ripen properly off the plant. So if you're not sure, just kind of leave it for a while until it, you get the rattle or, you know, the spring. And then things like poppies, you know, you can shake those all over the place. They're like a little salt shaker too, because they have little windows at the top. And when the windows open under their flat little top, um, when the windows pop open, the seeds are ripe, and then you can scatter them everywhere, and they're fun to do. And then, of course, California poppies have those long, curvy seed pods, and when they pop open, they scatter the seeds kind of explosively um, and quite generously. And they're tap-rooted, so poppies can be moved when they're very, very, very small, but not very successfully once they're bigger than that, unless you get the whole root, which doesn't always happen. Because you know, off working with the with the dried seeds. Yeah, it's better. It's easier. And kids really enjoy doing that. That's a fun project for um, getting kids involved. My grandkids like to cut seed pods open and look at them on, with a magnifying glass so they can sort of see what's going on in there at different stages. So we cut them open every month so they can watch the production of the seeds and how the, the ovaries swell and how the pods change. So it's really fun. Trying to think if there was more that we were going to talk about. Well, that looks like most of what we had on our little list. Bulbs, planting, transplanting. We talked a little bit about uh, um, priming, obviously. You didn't mention dividing specifically. But, oh, yeah. Um, I was going to talk about that because this is a wonderful time to divide plants. Things like hostas and iris, daylilies um, that are easy you know, just dig up the whole clump, or if it's a really big clump, you want two forks and two people digging together. Or sometimes you put the forks in back to back and <laughs> pop them out that way. Um, but once you get the clump up out of the ground, you can shake out as much soil as possible. And then sometimes you can tease the pieces apart, things like daylilies or hostas. Yeah. <laughs> you can usually just vibrate them pretty heavily and the pieces will kind of shake out. Um, some of them get really gnarly connected, like tight and then you have to actually cut them um, and I have a little dedicated saw <laughs> that I use to cut because I found that people don't actually like it if you borrow their nice tools and cut plants in half with them odd but true so I have a little folding saw that I use specifically for that um, but when you're cutting them up often the center especially things like Siberian iris the center will be often woody and not really all that great um, so that part can go in the compost and then all the offshoots on the sides, usually you can snap pieces off or break out pieces or cut pieces off. And then those um, shake out again, take off anything that wasn't like if you have a chunk and there's some top growth with no root on it, just put that in the compost too. But make sure you have an intact piece with some down facing roots and some up facing shoots, and then that will become a new plant. And if you want it to look full right away, clear space in your border and plant them in clusters, maybe six to 10 inches apart or a little wider. And that way it will look like a big full clump again, but it will have several years more to go because some plants will bloom themselves to death or kind of get so dense that they stop blooming because they're putting all their energy into making leaves. Leaves are okay, but a lot of times we were looking for the flowers. So division every three to five years is what is often recommended. 
um, for those very uh, ardent bloomers, right? Nice. So the other thing that you can do, of course, is take um, root cuttings of certain things. One plant that you can almost only move like in September, October is peonies. They do not, they resent moving and they don't move easily, but this is the time of year when you can actually move them if you want to, and you can also divide them. And those are the kind you really shake out and look at the way the root is, take an eye shoot with a dormant bud on it. Um, and those you can take and pot up and they should take really nicely at this time of year. But when you do peonies, you wanna make sure they're not too deep because if they're too deep, they'll come up what we call blind. They they will bloom, they won't bloom. They'll send up tons of foliage, but they won't send up flowers if the buds are too low below the surface of the soil. Okay. Ask me how you that. <laughs> You've had some very green peonies. Um, Holly, did you have another comment? Uh, no, I mean, this has answered a lot of questions and give me a lot more information. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that uh, that we will um, return to these topics and others in about a month. Yeah, you know, it's sort of interesting. It's like every year it's kind of the same, but every year the weather is different. And it seems like we are <laughs> watching plants respond in different ways than they used to. So some of the plants that you were tried and true Northwest classics are not really doing all that great. And again, one of the things I would say is in, if plants are failing, especially repeatedly. I did have someone say, I planted this particular thing four times in the same place and it just keeps dying. And I'm like, you know what? Don't put another one there. <laughs> That's not the right spot for that plant, but I want it there. It's like, well, then find one you can put in a very, very large pot and put the pot there because obviously the soil itself or something about that site is not you know, receptive to that plant. And we, we yeah, we've been, we've been reading, um braiding sweetgrass and Dr. Kimmerer talks about in uh, in the northern parts of the country where she's from Minnesota and so forth I guess or no um, Michigan I guess um, the maples are moving north mm -hmm. yeah They're on the move and, you know what's interesting is 10,000 years ago there were no Douglas firs in this part of the country that they followed climate change slowly. Plants are slow, but they do move, you know, and that a lot of things we consider to be fixed are not really, they're just moving on a very different cycle from what we do. Um, so one of the things you can think about is looking to Oregon, say, for coastal Oregon has a bunch of manzanitas, for instance, which traditionally people said, oh, they don't really do well here in the Northwest. Well, in the last decade or so, they have been proven to be quite successful here and they're some beautiful, hybrids um, and selected forms. So rather than planting another azalea that keeps getting azalea lace bug, try a manzanita that so far has no natural pests, <laughs> right? Um, that's kind of the way we're having to adjust and think about what we want to plant. And that's a, you know, you could make a case for it being a native plant. They are certainly not prolific at this particular in our zone yet, but they may well be, and you know, if we give them a hand, they probably That's will. Be ain't what well. it used to be. Arizona ain't what it used to be. Yeah, exactly. Um, but being a little inventive about what we plant and being really careful about taking notes about what does well and what doesn't um, will help us keep our gardens more resilient. Next meeting uh, in the garden shed or right beside it will be November 15th, I think, the Thank third uh, Wednesday, Wednesday in 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 November.